Okay, so today we're moving on in Chapter 5 to polynomial functions, and we're going to cover two sections, Section 5.2 and 5.3. And um, we're going to be doing sort of what we did for quadratics last night, but for polynomials um, in general. So we're going to be interested in, given the graph of a polynomial, can we write down an equation and vice versa? And we need some um, basic sort of stuff related to these guys. So um, let's start talking about our objectives. Um, in 5.2, we're going to be interested in introducing what are called power functions. They're just really special types of um, uh, polynomials for the ones that we're really interested in. Um, but we'll talk about them for a little bit because there are a couple questions in Affinity that um, ask you just to identify if something's a power function or not. So I don't think it's that interesting for us, but it's definitely going to help us understand what's called the end behavior um, of a power function and also the end behavior of a polynomial. So again, we're going to be introducing power functions. We're going to be talking about the end behavior of these power functions. Um, and we'll use it to then um, sort of identify polynomial functions and uh, look at what the end behavior of a polynomial function is. Um, OK, so that'll be what we're sort of talking about in 5.2. And it'll sort of bleed really uh, nicely into 5.3. So they're really closely related. Uh, we'll introduce the characteristics of the graphs of polynomial functions. And uh, for a quadratic, we had the idea of a vertex. And I had previously, I believe, called it a turning point. So we'll solidify that a bit more. Uh, the corresponding idea for a general polynomial is the idea of a turning point. So we'll um, sort of give some terminology to that. And we'll talk about um, the idea that factoring is the method for finding the zeros of a polynomial. So I'll give you a quick example of that um, here in a moment. Sorry, let me mute this uh, mic. Thanks. OK, so coming back. Um, we're going to talk about uh, factoring and how it leads into the notion of a multiplicity. Um, and we'll see that multiplicities sort of express themselves both in the equation itself in terms of the degree, but also in terms of the graph. So you can read off the multiplicity of a zero just from the graph itself. And uh, like I said, we'll be talking about the relationship to power functions in the end behavior, and then this idea about uh, the relationship between the degree of a polynomial and the number of turning points. Okay, so um, let's get started. And the first thing that I want to do is just a quick example before I do um, anything to remind you of a couple things. And then also just to introduce you to how you'll um, find the end behavior, and then we'll just sort of spell out everything um, in more detail with the slides. So the example we're going to look at is the following. Let's find the x-intercepts, the y-intercepts, and what we're going to call the end behavior. And I'll explain what the end behavior is uh, here in a moment. The end behavior of the following function. It's a polynomial, and um, it's going to be given in a factored form. So this polynomial has been sort of factored into a bunch of factors, and it looks like this. 2 times x minus 2 times x plus 5 times x minus 5. And it's really nice that it's been factored, because when it is factored, um, finding the x-intercepts and the zeros is really easy. OK? And I think I see that um, there's a couple questions. Slowly cutting out for you. Um, is everybody else good? Am I, is the video here choppy for you guys? Do we need to reset this? Angelique says, looks good. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. And again, if um, a lot of you are, are running out of it, then we may try and reset some stuff. Otherwise, um, I'll just ask you to maybe check out the recording for parts that you might have missed. But anyway, what I was saying here is that we're given a polynomial, and it's been factored for us. Um, Affinity is going to test your factoring with this uh, homework assignment, right? And you may have to go back to Chapter 1 and review some of the techniques there for um, factoring, because they may not give it to you in this factored form meaning you'll have to actually factor it, right? So you come on Monday with some of those questions or read through chapter one and remind yourself of some of those techniques. Um, but when it is factored, it's really easy to find the x-intercepts, right? Because remember, for any graph, the x-intercepts are just the places 
where y is equal to zero, right? And the y-intercepts are simply the places where x is equal to zero. And because it's a function, when x is equal to zero, there's only one possible output for y. It satisfies the vertical line test. So um, let's go ahead and find the y-intercept first. That's just going to be f of zero. And here you'll get 2 times 0 minus 2 times 0 plus 5 times 0 minus 5. Yeah, sorry, Ali. Um, hmm. Maybe a good idea to um, reload uh, your page or something like that and see if that helps you out. But again, I'll, I'll just keep monitoring, and if there's a lot of us, then... Um, We'll just have to maybe sign off and watch the recording afterward. Um, but anyway, so we're here, right? So this is 2 times negative 2, which is negative 4. Uh, and this is 5 times negative 5, which is negative 25. Negative 25 times negative 4 um, is 100. So here, the ordered pair is 0, 100. Right? That's where this graph, this polynomial, passes through um, the y-axis. Okay, but the x-axis, there's going to be quite a bit more, right? In this case over here, we're going to uh, let y be equal to 0. But remember, the f of x is the y. The output is the y. So this is 0 is equal to 2 times x minus 2 times x plus 5 times x minus 5. And here, we get 0 is equal to x minus 2, or 0 is equal to x plus 5, or 0 is equal to x minus 5. Because if any one of these three factors were equal to 0, well, then when I multiplied them all together, I would be equal to zero, okay? And it's tempting, um, like on an exam, to just jump right down to the next step. So here we're going to get x is equal to 2, x is equal to negative 5 for this one, and then uh, x is equal to 5 for that one. But um, remember to show your supporting work, right? So you need to include the equation, and you need to do, show the step where you sort of separate them into um, different pieces. Okay, now be careful. Here, they're asking us for the x-intercepts. These would be the zeros, right? When they ask you, what are the zeros of the function, these are the zeros, right? At 2, at negative 5, and 5, if I plug those in, the output is 0. Um, but the uh, intercept, on the other hand, is going to be 2, 0, negative 5, 0, and um, 5, 0, right? These are the x-intercepts. And um, what it means is it just passes through the x-axis at 2, at negative 5, and at 5. And um, so that's telling you where the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts are. We now want to talk a little bit about what's called the end behavior, okay? Um, the end behavior is uh, what happens when x gets really, really big, okay? So we refer to this as the end behavior. And it's just asking the question, what happens when x gets big? So let's think about end behavior. So what happens when x is large? Okay. And um, so that's what happens. Uh, and the question here is basically just saying, you know, in general, um, what's going on. So let's try to understand what would happen if I were to plug in a really big value um, of x, okay? So if I were to plug in a really, really big value of x, like a billion, um, then a billion and a billion minus 2 are roughly the same. So when x is large, so as you write it like this, so x goes to infinity. So when x is really large, um, this f of x here, is roughly equal to 2. Um, this is like a billion minus 2, so that might as well be x. This is a billion plus 5, so that might as well be x as well. And this is a billion minus 5, so this might as well be x as well, right? So in other words, you get um, that it looks essentially like 2x cubed when x is really, really big, okay? And um, what this means is that uh, when you plug values in that are really large, um, they're also going to get larger and larger. So the graph as we go to the right is going to get larger and larger and larger and larger and, and grow bigger and bigger. However, when we plug in numbers that are more and more negative, 
like negative 100, negative a billion, negative a trillion. Um, because this is x cubed, we're going to get a negative times a negative times a negative, and they're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and so they're going to go down the graph um, in the other direction. And we would indicate that um, this way, right? So that means go to the left as x goes to negative infinity, and this means go to the right. And um, what I was pointing out here is that as x gets bigger and bigger, um, the function gets bigger and bigger. And um, as x gets more and more to the left, more and more negative, the function becomes also more and more negative. So this is um, the notation that we'll use for the end behavior. And um, we sort of compared it to 2x cubed. And I'm going to talk about how we um, sort of get back to this uh, 2x cubed business uh, a little more systematically. But that's the x-intercepts, y-intercepts, and how it's related to um, factoring. Let's now jump back over here and um, talk about what a power function is. Because that 2x cubed that I uh, compared it to is what's called a power function. Okay. So here is your definition of a power function. A power function is any function of the form f of x is equal to x, I'm sorry, k times x to the power of p, where k and p are just numbers, right? So the x here is the input of the function. Um, so that's going to be a variable. But for power functions, the k and the p will be fixed. Um, the p is called the power, and the k is called the coefficient. So just some examples of power functions over here. Um, because infinity will ask you a question like this. You could have something like f of x is equal to 2 times x to the cube. That's a power function. Here the p is 3, here the k is 2. Um, you could have the k being something like negative 5, it could be negative, and the power being, um, you know, something like 8, right? So that's an, another example of a power function. And the power function, this is all it can have, right? It can't have any other more complicated things um, associated to it. The p could also be any real number. So it could be a half, so a square root is a power function. It could be a third. Um, it could be any number that you would like, right? But we're going to be primarily focused on when it's a whole number or an integer. And then something, for example, that's not a power function. Um, well, if it has more than one term, right, um, it's not going to be a power function. So something like this, it's the sum of two power functions, x squared and x cubed, but it's not a power function itself. Um, and, you know, just... Give, to give you another example, you could have something like, let's say, g of x is equal to, um, let's try to think about some functions we may have seen, uh, a rational function, so something like x plus 1 over x minus 2. Um, in that case, it doesn't look like x raised to a power, right? So in this case, um, it's not a power function. So if it's a number k, the unknown x is the base, and then a number or the power, then it's a power function. And again, be careful. You could have things like, you know, 5 times the square root of x. So remember, that's 5 times x to the 1 half. So even though they're written in terms of the radical form, um, they still may be a power function. Okay, and why am I telling you about power functions? Well, it turns out that power functions tell you everything you need to know about the end behavior of a polynomial. So let's talk about the end behavior of these power functions. Um, there are four types of power functions that um, you'll need to be familiar with. And um, the first thing that we'll look at is what happens when that coefficient is positive. Okay? So when the coefficient is positive and the power P is even, then you look just like a polynomial, um, I'm sorry, you look just like a parabola. Right? So these are like the quadratics we had. Um, and when the power is odd, then you look like an X cubed function. Um, the larger the power, the flatter this sort of bottom part becomes. But for the most part, they all look um, identical. And you could have observed this just by plugging in values, right? So if you plug in values of x and then, you know, graph all the points and connect the dots, you'll see that the, the general shape of these two guys, when k is positive, um, looks like a parabola opening upward here and just like x cubed on this graph. And that allows us to determine um, the entire uh, end behavior. Right? So every single uh, power function has the same end behavior um, if you have an even power and a constant that's positive. 
This just says as x gets further and further to the left, right, so x gets more and more negative, so we move along this direction, the graph of the function gets uh, larger and larger, and so we would say f of x goes to infinity. There's only two choices. x can go to positive infinity or negative infinity, and in this case it's getting larger and larger, so it goes to infinity. And um, the same thing is true when we go to the right. If we let x get larger and larger, so if we let x go to infinity, then this graph here just gets larger and larger in the y value, so f of x goes to infinity. Um, the thing that's different over here is that if you go to the left now for the odd power, then you'll go down. And this is because, you know, for example, when we were looking at x cubed, three negatives together make something that's still negative. So you'll keep going further and further down. So as x goes to negative infinity, this function will also go to negative infinity. So that just means it goes further and further down. And then on the right-hand side, as x goes to infinity, um, it gets larger and larger, so we say that f of x goes to infinity. So this is the symbolic notation that we'll use to describe end behavior, just arrows, right? So what happens when we go to the right and what happens when we go to the left? And, and really, it's just a matter is, are we going up when we go to the right? That's positive infinity. Or are we going down when we go to the right? Negative infinity. That's all they're, they're sort of indicating here um, with these two graphs. Um, and there's two other possibilities right, for a power function, because we didn't say anything about k being um, positive in the definition. So you could have a power function with k negative. And if you have a power function where k is negative, then basically what will happen is you'll just flip around the x-axis, right? So if I replace this whole function with its negative, it just replaces its y value with its negative, and so it'll jump down here. And then this one as well will just reflect across the x-axis. And so what you'll get is this picture here, right? So that one jumps from being pointing up to pointing down. And this one over here jumped from pointing up in this direction to pointing down in this direction, and then jumped from pointing down in this direction to jumping um, up in this direction now, okay? So this is what happens for an even power when the k is negative, and this is what happens for an odd power when the k is negative, okay? And the difference now is that this one goes down in both directions, and this one goes up when you go to the left and down when you go to the right. And we write that symbolically like this. So when x goes to the left, as x goes to negative infinity, the function goes further and further down. x goes to infinity. So as x goes to infinity, as we go further and further to the right, the function goes further and further down. So we say that f of x goes to negative infinity. And again, there are really only two choices. Either you're going up, positive infinity, or you're going down, negative infinity. Okay? And then over here, um, as we go to negative infinity, um, we're going up. So f of x goes to infinity. And as we go to positive infinity, um, as x goes further and further to the right, then the function goes further and further down. Okay, and the reason why we're doing this is that all polynomials, right, even the ones that are not power functions, um, will satisfy the same end behavior. So let's try to maybe um, use a bit of the um, stuff that we've looked at here and then write down the end behavior before we look at polynomials. Okay, so here is the power even or odd. So in the chat, if you can identify the power here, this is a power function, uh, but I'm asking, is the power even or odd? Well, what is the power in this case? So some people are saying odd. I see somebody saying even. What's the actual power? So the 4 is the power, because that's the exponent, that was that p, and the k is the coefficient, okay? So here, the power is even. Uh, that's because the p is equal to 4, all right? And the coefficient was the k, and in this case, it's um, negative 5. So because it was uh, an even power, it looked like a um, parabola, right? Either opening up or opening down. And in this case, because the k is negative uh, 5, it was opening downward, right? So the graph here um, is going to look basically something like this. Okay, and so as we go to positive infinity and negative infinity, we go further and further down. So we would write this symbolically as the following. As x goes to infinity, f of x goes to negative infinity. So this is the end behavior. Okay, 
And we would then write as x goes to negative infinity, f of x also goes to negative infinity. And again, all that means is that as I go down in this direction, I'm going to get further and further down, right? That's what this piece means. And then this side over here just meant that as I go further and further to the right, I also go further and further down. And there are only two options, positive or negative infinity for one of these guys. Okay. So that picture is telling you the four possibilities. Um, we're not really interested so much in power functions uh, in this section, but more in terms of polynomials. But the power functions tell us everything we need to know about the end behavior of a polynomial. So this is a uh, graphic that we had back from, I think, the first um, uh, chapter when we were talking about polynomials. And we said that if we write it in descending order, then the term with the highest power in it um, was called the leading term. The coefficient of the leading term was called the leading coefficient. And um, that highest power in the polynomial was called the degree of the polynomial. And the cool thing here, again, is that if you write it in this format, then it becomes pretty apparent that when x is really big, all of these terms over here don't matter at all, right? So for example, when x is a trillion, a trillion raised to the power of n, when n is something like 3 or even 4, is so much bigger than x squared that the x squared doesn't matter at all. And so when you're looking at n behavior of a polynomial, all you have to do is identify the leading term. Okay? And once you have that leading term, you can go down to this box that's down here um, sort of on the bottom, and you can see that for any polynomial, the n behavior of the polynomial will match the end behavior of the power function, which just consists only of the leading term. Because when x is really big, that's the only thing that matters, right? That's the term that takes over. And so when we were looking at that graph before, when we um, looked at that 2x cubed function and identified that end behavior at the beginning, we were really just identifying whatever the leading term was, right? And that leading term was a 2x cubed. Okay, so when you want to find the end behavior of a polynomial, you look to its leading term, and then um, that'll tell you if you're going to positive or negative infinity. This is really helpful when you're trying to rule out graphs as being polynomials. So infinity will ask you, like, here's a graph. Is this a polynomial or not? And um, if it doesn't match the end behavior, one of these four possible cases, then you know it's certainly not a, um, a polynomial. So that's a good way to answer some of those questions in infinity. Okay, so now let's come back and talk a bit about the characteristics of polynomials that you'll need to know. So remember, we talked about the idea of a vertex and the x-intercept and y-intercept and the line of symmetry for a quadratic. Um, now we're going to introduce sort of some corresponding ideas, but for just general polynomials, okay? So the corresponding notion of sort of a vertex um, is what we'll call a turning point. And there's not going to um, be only one vertex like there was for a quadratic. There may be multiple turning points, and we're going to talk about um, how many there can be um, and how it's related to the degree. But what do we mean by a turning point? Well, a turning point is just some place where the graph changes from either increasing to decreasing. So this would be um, a possible turning point. Or we go from decreasing back to increasing. This would be another turning point down here. So turning points just mean that the graph turns around, right? And the cool thing here is that if you have two x-intercepts or two zeros, then there has to be a turning point in between them, right? Why? Because if you were sort of going up in this direction here, well, then I'd have to kind of turn back around to come back to this uh, zero over here, okay? So in between um, two zeros, there's potentially um, a turning point um, sort of sitting in between the two of them. And you can see over here as well, right? So it was, I started coming down and then I had to come back around. So there was this turning point um, sitting down here. And what I'm trying to point out is that if there are three zeros, there's at most two turning points, right? Because in between any two pairs of zeros, that's where we could have um, a turning point. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. But remember, we called these um, the zeros if we're talking about the value. And then the ordered pair is called the x-intercept. Here, the ordered pair um, where we intersect the y-axis is called the y-intercept. Okay, so these are the main features of a polynomial. We'll need one more thing called the multiplicity. And the multiplicity tells you uh, 
how the grass passes through the x-axis. Sometimes we can sort of hit it and then bounce back, and in other cases, we'll go right through it. Um, and the multiplicity will be um, an indicator of, of that. Okay, so um, let's talk about how multiplicity is related to um, degree. I'm sorry, not multiplicity. Uh, turning points are related to degree. So um, you give me a polynomial of degree n. So let's just fix an example first and think about a polynomial of degree 2. That's a quadratic, okay? Um, a quadratic uh, is a parabola, and if it's opening upward, it looks something like this. In that case, the degree is 2, and the number of turning points is 1. Right? The vertex will always be a turning point. And so what we have in that case is possibly n x-intercepts and n minus 1 turning points. Right? Notice here there are no x-intercepts at all because it doesn't hit the x-axis at all. And so in this statement, um, they're using the term at most. Right? At most. But we could have also drawn um, an example of a parabola that had two x-intercepts um, like this. Right? So here we would have two x-intercepts and one um, turning point on the bottom. And so uh, the same story is going to be true for all polynomials of degree n. Um, if you start with a polynomial of degree n, there can be at most n x-intercepts and at most n minus one turning points. And don't, don't confuse what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that there will be n x-intercepts. There could be less. I'm saying there's at most n uh, x-intercepts, and there's at most n minus 1 turning points. Again, it doesn't mean that there is n minus 1 turning points. It's just at most there's n minus 1 turning points. And when the n is equal to 2, we have a parabola. And again, we have at most two x-intercepts and one turning point. And in that case, there will always be one turning point. Um, and the number of x-intercepts, like we said previously, could be none. Um, two or just one, okay? So why is that the case? Well, if you're dealing with an arbitrary polynomial, right? So if you have a polynomial that looks like f of x is equal to ax to the n and then a bunch of other stuff like x squared plus x plus 7, um, and this is the leading coefficient, then when you try to factor this um, into a bunch of pieces, the number of factors that you can have is at most n factors. And the reason why is that there'll be an x here, an x here, an x here, and an x here. And if you have more than n factors, when you multiply them out, you get something bigger than x to the n. So when you're trying to find those x-intercepts, the degree is sort of blocking the number of intercepts you could possibly obtain because of the way that factoring is working. Okay? So that's where this comes from. And it's useful for answering some questions um, in a city. So let's see some examples of the type of thing you might see in infinity. So here's a question that can look sort of overwhelming um, at first glance, but it's actually pretty simple, okay? So here they're asking you, without crafting it, determine the maximum number of x-intercepts. Now, they're not asking you to determine the number of x-intercepts, just the maximum number of x-intercepts. And they also want you to determine the max number of turning points. And it's pretty easy. All you have to do is determine what the degree is. Okay? If you know what the degree is, you're going to know the answer to both of these questions. So look at that guy. Remember, it's not in general form. And in the chat, just respond with um, what the degree is. So what is the degree? of this polynomial. Okay, so, so most of you are recognizing that even though it's not written with the highest power coming first, the highest power there is that 14 times x to the power of 12, okay? So that term, that 14 times x to the power of 12, is telling you that the degree of this polynomial is 12. So the number, the maximum number of x-intercepts if we tried to factor this thing, there could be at most 12 factors, um, it's 12, okay? How many uh, possible turning points could we have? What's the most number of turning points that this graph could have? 
Yeah, you just subtract one from that, right? So this is going to be 12 minus 1 or 11. And again, it doesn't mean that there are 11. If I graph this function, it's not going to tell me that there are 11. It's just telling me from that last film that there's a max, right? And that's what they're asking you in the question. Max. It looks like a tough question, but they're just asking you to identify the degree and subtract one. Okay, so we should also be able to identify the end behavior of this guy. So notice I, I've identified that leading coefficient. This is like a separate question. Um, I identified that leading coefficient. So when x is really big, this is all that really matters. It's an even power, and the k is positive. So it looks something like this when we zoom out. And so it'll go to positive infinity as x goes to infinity, and positive infinity as x goes to negative infinity. And so we know the end behavior just directly from that leading coefficient as well. So the leading coefficient is telling us a lot of information about the graph, right? It's telling us um, how many possible turning points, how many x-intercepts, and also the end behavior um, of what the uh, graph will look like. Okay. So let's now um, answer a question. And I took this one directly off at Cindy. That's why the graph here looks a little bit funky, just so you can see that it's um, an actual example from infinity. Here, they're saying, okay, determine the least possible degree of a polynomial function shown, okay? And I'll just say, for example, it can't be a degree one polynomial. A degree one polynomial is just a line, and it's clearly not a line. But the theorem that we just had before would tell us that there's no turning points in a line, right? And this thing definitely has um, more than one turning point. So if we only have one turning point, or I'm sorry, no turning points, um, then we're aligned, right? But in this case, we do. So it, it has to be bigger than degree one. Um, it also can't be degree two, right? Because the, the statement tells us that a degree two polynomial can have at most one turning point at the vertex, right? That's the only one. There's only one turning point. Um, how many turning points does this graph have? So, yeah, so the, the turning points are two. There's one coming up and then coming back down and then down and back up. So there's two turning points. And so that means that it key degree one, it can't be degree two. Um, it could possibly be degree three, right? Because a degree three could have two turning points. And we can also look at the intercepts, right? So the intercepts, there's three intercepts here as well, um, x-intercepts. But be careful, you can't solve this question with just x-intercepts because I could have moved the whole graph up and it wouldn't have any x-intercepts at all. So we really have to be thinking about turning points here. And because there's two turning points, um, the least degree is three. And that's again because there are two turning points. So for these questions, just count the number of turning points and add one. And there you go. You can answer all of the questions in infinity about the least possible degree of a given graph. Now, what we're going to be most interested in doing, and this is going to be sort of the last thing we do in class, is to write down an equation of something like this, right? So um, there are some features here that we're not really picking up on yet related to how this graph goes through the x-axis. And um, the way that it passes through the x-axis is um, going to be called the multiplicity. So let's try and introduce um, that concept uh, now. And um, I think I did this example already. So let's go to this multiplicity thing. Okay. okay, so somebody gives you that polynomial of degree n. So its leading coefficient has an x to the n in it. And then um, you factor it into a bunch of pieces, right? So you factor it, and you might get something like we had before, like you know, x minus 2 times x plus 5 times x minus 5, and then I think we had a 2 out from the front, right? So you factor this whole thing, and you um, figure out each one of these factors, and each of the factors has degree 1, okay? So the first thing that you should know is that for each one of those factors, you're going to get a 0, right? So, for example, if you have an x minus h factor somewhere, then x equals h will be a 0. Right? So here there was a 0 at 2, there was a 0 at negative 5, and there was a 0 at 5. Um, but it turns out that um, when you factor a polynomial, it could be the case that you might have a different power up here, like maybe a 2 here and a 3 there. I'm just making that up in this case. This is not um, part of that previous example. 
But um, when you factor it like this, then uh, you get a power up here. And this power P is called the multiplicity of P. Okay? So um, here we would have a 0 at 2. And the multiplicity is um, 2, right? Because that's the power. Here, this one, we have a 0 at x equals negative 5, right? So if I set that equal to 0 in sulfur, I get x equals negative 5. And here, the multiplicity is that power, so the multiplicity would be 3, okay? This one over here has a 0, or this factor gives us a 0 at x equals 5, but what's the multiplicity? What do we get for a multiplicity on that one? Okay, so if you don't see a power, that's exactly right. So this is multiplicity one, okay? Um, and so that example where I just had, you know, no powers up here at all, they all had multiplicity one, you looked at it. okay? And it turns out that the multiplicity um, determines how the graph passes through the x-axis. If the multiplicity is even or odd, it's gonna change the behavior, okay? So let's see the, the sort of the, the way to determine this. Somebody gives you the graph of an nth degree polynomial, and you identify the zeros, right? So like, let me just, somebody just says, okay, here's a graph of a polynomial. I'm just gonna make one up here. And they give you something like this. Here's the graph of a polynomial. And um, they ask you to identify the zeros and identify the multiplicity of those zeros. Okay, so here's a zero, here's a zero, here's a zero, and here's a zero. And um, if the graph was labeled, you would just write down whatever the x values are, right? But um, what we're gonna be interested in doing is identifying from the graph itself, this picture, what the multiplicities are. And um, you can do that, and we'll jump straight to two first, right? If the graph touches the x-axis and bounces off the x-axis, then the multiplicity is even. If um, instead it crosses through the x-axis at that zero, the multiplicity is odd. Okay, so let's look at this picture here. This passes through, so this multiplicity, whatever it is, is odd. Now we don't know if it's three or five or seven, but we do know it's off, okay? This multiplicity, is it even or off? How about this one? Well, someone's uh, saying odd, some are saying even, some people have an even with a question mark. You'll notice this one goes down and through, and this one comes up and through. And because it goes through the graph, it's still off, right? So the multiplicity is telling you whether or not you go through the graph at the zero or not. So here, this one does not, right? See, it hits the graph, and then it bounces off the graph. And you could do that also from below, right? You could have done that from below. So this would have a multiplicity um, that is even. And what about this last one? Is this an even or an odd multiplicity? That last uh, guy over here. Multiplicity is what? Even or odd? Yeah, that one's going to be odd because it passes through. Okay. So um, you could just look at the graph and see if the zeros um, are multiplicities that are even or odd. Now it's not going to tell you the power p, but it'll tell you if they're even or odd. Okay. And um, one nice thing that happens is that once you determine all the multiplicities, they have to add up to the degree. So this can be a little bit helpful um, with some questions. Now, just going back to one, one thing that uh, happens is if when you pass through the graph, so through the x-axis, it looks like a line, then you can sort of assume that it's odd, but that it's also of um, multiplicity one. But that's really sort of subjective, so I wouldn't pay too much attention other than that if it passes through, it's odd, and if it bounces off, it's even. So let's now um, talk about the process of, you know, given the graph, let's write down the equation and we'll do two examples of it, okay? So how do we, uh, given the graph of a polynomial, like the one behind me, write down a formula for that polynomial, okay? Um, 
the first thing that you'll do is identify the zeros, the x-intercept. So just like we've done in this picture. Here's a zero, here's a zero, here's a zero, here's a zero. And, and the graph will have to be, you know, have enough information so that you can actually identify it. I haven't written down the numbers here. Um, but you have to be able to identify what those numbers are, right? Okay. And then the next thing that you want to do is examine the behavior of the graph at those intercepts and determine the multiplicity of each factor. So here we would say, okay, does it pass through the graph and determine is it even or is it odd? In this case it was odd, in this case it was odd, it was even, and then it was odd, okay? And um, what that's gonna allow you to do is sort of get a good idea of what it is. And most of the time we'll assume that it's as small as possible. So if it's odd, we'll say it's probably degree one, and if it's even, um, it's probably a degree two, okay? But there are some instances when that won't work out for us. But I think for most of the homework problems, you can do that. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll find a polynomial of least degree containing all of the factors found in the previous step. And this is the key issue here. If we're looking for the one with least degree, then it is unique, right? Then we can actually assume if it's odd, it's one, and if it's even, it's two. So that's what they mean by least degree here. But just like a quadratic, we'll have to determine some stretching and squeezing factor at the very end. And that will require us to know one further point, something other than just the x-intercept. Okay? Usually we can use the y-intercept for that as long as it's not um, right at the origin. So let's see, a pro let's see that process, okay? So here's a graph. And we'd like to write down the um, formula for this graph. So our first step is to identify the zeros. So in the chat, um, you'll notice that there are three zeros. In the chat, respond with the value of the three zeros. Where are they at? Okay, so we've got one at negative three. Boom, here. We've got one at two here, and we've got uh, another one here at five. So everybody has three, two, um, and five. Okay, so now the next step is to identify the potential multiplicities, right? So now in the same order, let's go negative three, two, five. Tell me if the multiplicity is even or off, right? So you might have like a string of three even or off. What do you get here? Yeah, yeah so the negative three passes through, so that's odd. Uh, the two bounces off, so that's even, and then the five goes through again, so that's odd, okay? And it, the question here should be really write down a polynomial of least degree, right, of least degree, and I think on infinity they'll ask you least degree most of the time. So let's write down roughly, based on this information, a polynomial that satisfies those properties, okay? So here it is. Um, we're going to have some function f of x, and we want it to have a zero at negative three. If we want a zero at negative three, we put a term that looks like this, an x plus three term, okay? That's because if I set this equal to zero and solve for uh, the x, I'll get x is negative three. And we said that the multiplicity of the negative three term was odd, uh, so I'm just gonna put a one there. I'm gonna assume that it's as small as possible, a one, okay? And um, if you'd like, you don't even have to write the one. If you just leave it off, it means that there's a one there anyway. The next zero occurred at two. And so there, we would need a factor of x minus two. We observed in that case that the graph had even multiplicity, and the smallest even number that we could possibly choose is two. So we would put two there, x minus two squared. And then finally, the last term, um, the last zero was at five, so we need an x minus five term, and we saw the multiplicity there was odd. So we would put a one there. And again, we would normally just leave these off, right? So we've now gone through the first couple of steps, and we're not quite done, and I'll explain why. But let me just come back to, um, sorry guys, come back to our graph here and point out that if we wrote down the function that we just did, 
and we tried to plug in x is equal to zero, we wouldn't get negative two. So right now we have the multiplicities correct, we have the zeros correct, but the stretching and squeezing, it could have been stretched out or, you know, um, compressed or something like that. So we need to go back and um, check it out. Uh, yeah, Hannah, that's right. Thanks uh, for answering that question. Um, cool. Um, okay, so anyway, we're coming back to this, and, and I'm pointing out that now we, we don't know what the compression or the stretching or squeezing is, so we need to figure that out, right? And I'm just going to go back to that um, how-to that we had, just to remind you of where we're at. So we did one, we found the x-intercepts. We did two, we examined the multiplicity, and now we've done three. We have wrote down a polynomial that, you know, has all of the multiplicity built in. The last thing that we've got to do is figure out that stretch factor, okay? So how are we going to do that for this graph? Well, we just add in a stretching factor. I'm going to call it A. We don't know what the A is, but certainly um, that is a stretching factor, right? And that should take into account all the stretching that we need. And if we come back to the graph, all we have to do is pick one other point on the graph, any point that you would like. And I'm going to pick the simplest one here at negative 2, um, or 0, negative 2, right? So that's the y-intercept. And I'm going to use that information to um, solve this problem. So the y-intercept, again, was at x equals 0, y equals negative 2. And you can just plug that in to figure out what a is, right? So here's the y value, and the x value is 0. Okay, so everywhere there's an x, I plug in 0. Everywhere there's an s of x, I plug in the y value, which is negative 2. Um, in this case, if you multiply all of that out on this end, you get negative 2 is equal to 60 times a. And then you can divide by 60, and you get negative 2 over 60 is equal to a. And you simplify that, and you get negative, sorry, this should have been negative 60 over here. Yeah, yeah that's a negative number. That's a positive number of positive. This just would be negative 60. Um, and then you divide by um, negative 60, and you simplify this, and you get 1 30th. So the stretching factor here is 1 30th, OK? And that means that we can write down our answer. So the f of x is going to be 1 30th times x plus 3 times x minus 2 squared times x minus 5. And this is a polynomial that satisfies all the properties. Um, I just multiplied all of these out, right? So this is 3 um, times negative 2 squared. So negative 2 squared, uh, that's 4. 3 times 4 uh, is 12. 12 times 5 is 60. Um, and that's a negative 5, so it should be negative 60. Just multiplying all these numbers out over here. OK. And there we have it. Right? So that's how you'll go from the graph back to the equation. Um, let's do one more, just similar to the homework, and then um, we'll be done for the day. Uh, sometimes they'll give you the information not in terms of the graph, but just in terms of you know, where the zeros are and where the multiplicities are. And here's an example of that. And um, let's just um, plug in the info, right? So we know that it's a degree 4 polynomial. Um, and we've got a root at uh, negative 4, so there's going to be a term that looks like this, an x plus 4 term. And the multiplicity of that term is 2. Okay, so we'll have a 2 there. The next term is uh, 0 at negative 2, so that means that we'll have an x plus 2 term. And its multiplicity here is given by 1. Um, and then finally, we've got a final um, root, or zero, at negative three. So that's an x plus three term. And its multiplicity is just one. So we'll just leave, um, leave it off. And then finally, they tell us what the y-intercept is. It's at zero, 192. So the formula that we should be looking at looks like this. f of x is equal to a times all of this, because we don't know what the stretching factor is. And now we can figure out the a by plugging in the point. So 192 is the y value. And then here we get 0 plus 4 squared, 0 plus 2 times 0 plus 3. 
Okay, and um, in this side we get 192. And um, let me jump out to the whole screen so you can see what I'm running down. And on this side, if you multiply this out, you get 4 squared, which is 16. Here you get 2 times 3, which is 6. And then the 16 times 6 is going to give you 96. So you get 96 times A. And then you just solve for the A, right? So you get 192 over 96 is equal to A. And um, that's your stretching factor. And uh, here, 192 divided by 96 is actually just 2. Okay? So 192 divided by 96 is simply 2. And so the answer to this question, right, is now replacing that A with 2. So here is the answer. F of X is equal to 2 times X plus 4 squared times X plus 2 times X plus 3. So we have 0 is at negative 3, negative 2, and negative 4. This one has multiplicity 2, the other has multiplicity 1, and we've got the stretching factor of 2 that guarantees we're at the point 0, 92. And that's what they were asking for here in this question. And you'll see questions like this um, in infinity as well. Okay, so that's all uh, I'm talking about today. Remember, the factoring can be a bit tough. So come to class with questions about um, the factoring if you need help with some of that or review um, the chapter one stuff. Okay, have a nice day.